Thank you, Handbell. That's a beautiful way to begin our worship this morning. I want to welcome all of you to our worship service today. My name is Missy Jensen, and I'm one of the pastors here at Oak Hill, and along with Pastor Stephen Sanders, we'll be leading you in worship today. I want to say a special welcome to our folks that are worshiping with us online. Uh, we invite you to comment and interact with one another and let us know that you are with us today as well. For those of you in the sanctuary, we invite you to fill out that white card that's in your bulletin and let us know that you are here and if you have any prayer concerns, you can place those on the bottom and then put those in the offering plate later in the service. As we begin our time together as the community of God, I invite you to stand and greet one another in the name of our Lord. I invite you to remain standing now and join me in our call to worship. God said, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord. Jesus said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come in the name of the Spirit, resting from our labors. Let us worship God through our play this day. Now let's join in singing, Come Christians, join to sing. The words are on the screen, or you can find it in your hymnal on page 158.
my microphone break, is it breaking up? Okay, um, a couple of things. Um, in your bulletin, there is a prayer and registration card, and as part of worship, I invite you to share any joys or concerns that you have and be lifting those. Um, if you're worshiping with us online, if you would just type any prayer concerns that you have, and one of our, and, and, and we will be um, um, lifting you in prayer. And I, I lift a couple of things in particular to you as we come together. Um, you can look in our prayer list, and we have um, many uh, joys and concerns lifting there. A couple of things in particular. We've had um, a, a death within the life of Oak Hill. Um, Lauren Okrina died this last week, and we lift his wife, Helen, and family in prayer to you. And I invite you to lift them in prayer. Lord, in your mercy. And also lift prayers for Alice and Bill Wiley. Bill has been in the hospital all, all week, and he had a stroke last night, and, and Bill is dying. And so we ask that you keep um, Alice in prayer, um, and she asks for, for no more visitors at this point. So we lift them. Lord, in your mercy. And also for Larry Kaiser, who has been hospitalized this week. Um, and he has a, a, a large blood clot in his leg and also some other health issues going on. So for Larry and Nancy. Lord, in your mercy. And today's Father's Day. And as part of our time of worship, we're going to be lifting the fathers in our lives in prayer to God. And so I invite you to settle down and settle in, put your feet on the ground if they reach that far, put your hands in your lap, and open them toward heaven in a spirit of receiving, and take a deep breath now, and let it out. Take a deep breath, and let it out. O most holy and gracious God, we come to you this morning. We come to you from a life that is so often busy, filled with work and school and doctor's appointments and errands and sports and activities. We come into this time and this space, O Lord, and we seek to slow down and be in your presence. In the stillness of this morning, we take a deep breath and let it out. We take a deep breath and let it out. As we breathe in, O oh God, help us to breathe in your peace and your presence. And as we breathe out, let us breathe out the worries and concerns that rest upon our hearts. Holy God, we lift to you this morning those people and situations that are in our hearts. For Helen and Bill and Larry, for those others, O oh God, who are dear to us and whose names and situations rest upon our lives, we lift them before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we lift our thanksgivings. We lift to you the things for which our hearts rejoice for the voices of children, for the goodness of life that we experience, for people who love and care for us and stick with us through life. Lord, in your mercy. And we lift before you situations in the world, those that we know about personally and those that we just hear about on the news for people who live in war zones, for those struggling with addiction, for people who are hungry, for those who face violence that we don't even want to imagine. Lord, in your mercy. And on this Father's Day, we paused to remember the fathers in our lives, for our own fathers who have given us life and love. We pray that we, O oh Lord, might show them respect and love. Lord, in your mercy. 
for fathers who have lost a child through death, that their faith may give them hope, and that their family and friends might support and console them. Lord, in your mercy. For men, though without children of their own, who like fathers have nurtured and cared for us. Lord, in your mercy. For fathers who have been unable to be a source of strength, who have not responded to their children and have not sustained their families. Lord, in your mercy. O God, who loves us like a father, in your wisdom and goodness you made all things. Bless these men that they may be strengthened as Christian fathers. Let their example of faith and love shine forth and grant that we, their sons and daughters, may honor them always with a spirit of profound respect. We lift these prayers of our hearts through Christ's most holy name as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite our children in the congregation, children of all ages, if you would come up front for a time with Miss Carla. Can you all come on forward? Come on up. Come on, Charlie. Everybody. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. I'm so glad you guys are here. I have a question that I know you'll be able to answer. You guys have a new baby brother, don't you? Do you have any special baby stuff at your house? What are some things that you need when you have a new baby? Pacifiers, what else? Anybody? Bottles, you need lots of stuff for diapers. You need lots of stuff for babies. Babies have to have a special kind of bed called a crib milk. They have to have special food. Yeah. Do you have to have a special stroller for babies? Babies need so much stuff special for babies. Well, yeah, they, babies need lots of special stuff. Well, I have, you guys know Abe, who's 10, not a baby, and Eloise, who's seven, not a baby. So we don't have any babies. We didn't have any babies at our house. Well, in December, we found out that we were going to get two babies. So we went from no babies to two babies. And, and we didn't have any baby stuff. We didn't have any baby stuff. Miss Carla loves to get rid of stuff. And sometimes to my detriment, I am a little trigger happy on getting rid of stuff. We didn't have any baby stuff. But God said it was time that we needed to have these babies. And guess what? By the time the babies came, we had everything we needed. We had cribs. We did run out of wipes recently, but <laughs> that you don't want to do that. But we had bottles. We had a crib. We had a stroller. And we needed those things. You got you to gotta have those things for a baby. And God made sure that we had it. God used this church to give us the things that we need. God used our families. God used an organization called Foster Village that helps people welcome kids into their home. So um, when Jesus picked out his disciples, 
Some of them we remember as being, you know, wrote special books and did special things. Some of them we remember as not being that great. Anybody remember Judas? He betrayed Jesus. So God calls us. God gives us important stuff to do. And guess what? We don't have to, we don't have to deserve it. We don't have to be ready. God will get us ready. God will give us what we need to do what we need. That makes me feel a lot better, doesn't it? So whenever you have a challenge, whether it's a little tiny one or a really big one, you can know, even if you're nervous or scared, that God will give you what you need to be ready. Okay? Will you guys pray with me? Dear God, Thank you that you provide everything we need when we need it. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming down, guys. We're going some fun with um, the second hymn this morning. If the choir could come on up and take their places, we're going to sing this in a round. The melody I hope most of you are familiar with, it goes da dee 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 Do you, Does that sound familiar to you at all? Um, so we're going to divide into three groups. So this, we're going to divide, let's see. How about just like, Mary, you go with this group and, and just kind of through there like that. So all of you will sing with this group. And then the middle, these people, and these people right here. Missy, you're in the middle group. Okay, middle group, come over here. Okay, Bob, would you come sing with the middle group for me? And yeah, Barbara, that's great. And then we have the third group over here, and that's... All of you guys all the way over there, okay? And the playground, if they want to sing with us. So we're going to start, um, oh, God, you made us. I think I'm too low. I'm usually too low. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, God, is the first pitch ready? So y'all are going to start, and then they start, and then they start. And I'm going to kind of come out here and. Amen. We have some pictures to show you. Would you throw those slides up? This last week, we had 11 middle school and high schoolers from Oak Hill and five adults with about 100 people in San Marcos. And we were on a mission trip with UM Army. 
we had kids who were building wheelchair ramps and building, putting on railing. They were sorting food at the food bank. They were painting rooms in a transitional living shelter. They were having fun playing nine square, and they were goofing off and eating and playing, and then they would gather in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock in the blessed a.m., and then at 10 o'clock at night for worship every day. And it was holy. It was good. I got to drop off. I, I, I was working with five teams coordinating what they were doing. And I asked one woman, I said, what difference is this making for you? She and her husband lived in a little house right next door to a church. And the youth had put in a wheelchair ramp for her. And I asked, I asked Naomi, I said, what difference does this make for you? And she said, it gives me freedom. I can now go next door to my church. She said, I have been stuck inside for the last two years except for doctor's appointments. For two years she had been inside. And our teenagers put up a handicap ramp, a wheelchair ramp. And they painted it so she wouldn't slip. And her husband can take her down and drive her next door. What our teenagers did this week was they experienced the love of God in community. They gave of their hearts and their lives and their energy. It was 173 degrees in San Marcos this last week. And their work gave a lot of people a lot. And they gave Naomi her freedom. Amen? Amen. My friends, you are part of that. You are part of blessing the lives of these teenagers so that they can bless others. This week, we have a second mission trip leading. We have mostly, we have many of our high school kids. Their names are printed in the bulletin in the upper right-hand corner. Joseph, Hayden, Carson, Aiden, Haley, Chase. They are going this week to be the hands and feet of Christ in Nashville. And we're going to get to hear the stories of our teenagers later this, later this summer. But I want to let you know that through your support of our teenagers and through the adults who went with them on these journeys and through their hard work and sweat and toil, they have blessed the lives of other people. And somewhere in the midst of that, their lives are changed. Amen. In just a moment, our ushers are going to come forward. And our musicians are going to play. They're going to be lifting up their offering to God. And I invite you to join with my wife and me in offering yourself and your resources to God. You can give in many ways to God's work through Oak Hill. You can give by going online. You can text the number on your screen. You can place cash or a check in the offering plate. But I want to let you know that your offering is an act of faith. It is giving of your resources to bless someone's life. And when you bless someone's life, their lives will bless someone else. And it goes on and on and on. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we give thanks for the blessings you give us. We give thanks for the teenagers who gave of themselves in service and love in San Marcos this week. And we give thanks for the teenagers and adults who are going to offer themselves in love in Nashville. We pray for their safe travel and we pray, O oh God, that through their work and worship, through their fellowship and time of just goofing off, that you might stir within their lives and you might touch the lives of your children. We pray your blessings upon this offering that we might use it wisely and faithfully. 
in your work of restoring the world. We lift our prayers through Christ's most holy name. And all God's people say,
Good morning, friends, young and old. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask you to bow your heads, and we'll start with the prayer for illumination. Oh God, as we turn to your scripture, send your Holy Spirit to infuse your word with your truth and grace, so that the good news of your love would shine before our eyes and delight our senses, so that we cannot help but respond with wonder, faith, and trust. Amen. The scripture today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, 31, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Then God said, Let us make humans in our image according to our likeness, and let them have a dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and all over the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished in all of the multitude. On the sixth day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, and because on it, God created from all the work that he had done in creation. This is the word of our Lord. Well, we are continuing our worship series called Let Us Play. So last week, we talked about how as we grow older, some of us let our play muscles atrophy. We take ourselves too seriously. We forget to engage in play because we're so important, right? So I challenged you to take some time to play this week, and I invited you to send me pictures. Some of you did your homework, so thank you. But what, let me just check the room and see what did y'all do for play this week? I want you to actually respond. Played in the water. It's a good week for that. Dominoes. Mission trip. God bless you. Mary, what did you do? What, you went to the zoo? You could preach next week because we're going to talk about <laughs> how God plays in creation and all those cool animals. You went to the grotto in Washington. Scrabble. What did you do, Alyssa? You watched a movie? Awesome. Good. Played nine square with teenagers. Bless you. <laughs> Lots of mission trip survivors this week. We're grateful for you. Played in the garden. Very good. Awesome. Well, I want you to keep playing this summer. But we're going to play right now, and I know the introverts in the room are going to hate me. But it's just going to be one minute, and it'll be over. So I want you to find a partner, and I need somebody that's willing to come up here and be my partner. Any takers? Alyssa, thank you. All right, so stand up. Face your partner. One of you is going to be A, and the other person is going to be B. So decide right now which one you're going to be, okay? All right, we're going to play the mirror game. So what we're going to do is I'm A and I'm going to lead first. So B, you have to follow whatever movement A does. All right, now B, you take a turn, you lead, and A, follow.
All right, A, your turn again. <laughs> All right, and B, your turn to lead. <laughs> there, yeah. Okay, and we're done. Thank you. <laughs> what did you bring me? Colors. Thank you. Can you go take those back to the playground? Okay. We are playing the mirror game because as you just heard in our scripture, we are made in whose image? God's image. And we are created to reflect what God does in the world. So I want you to keep that in mind throughout the sermon today, to think about what it is you are doing to reflect God in our world. Now in our society today, as I mentioned before, we are obsessed with work and productivity. Some of you in retirement tell me that you are busier now and you don't know how you had time to work, right? And when you think about it, when we are interacting with the people we love, when we're reunited at the end of the day, we ask each other, what'd you do today, right? If it's been a longer time, we ask, what have you been up to? We want to know what we're accomplishing, what to do, lists have been checked off. We want to hear that progress is being made for the procrastinators that we live with, right? Even though there's work still out there, we want to know that you are getting after it. We care that you're doing things and accomplishing things in life. And has anyone in here ever felt guilty about having to miss work due to illness? Anybody? This last week, Pastor Ryan and Pastor Stephen were in San Marcos with the youth, and I was the solo pastor. Guess who got a sinus infection? Right? And I was so disappointed in myself because I didn't want to disappoint you. I mean, what if somebody needed a pastor and I couldn't be there? So I went to the doctor. And I told the doctor what I had. <laughs> and I told him what he needed to prescribe. I said, I need a Z-Pack and a steroid. I've got to be better by Sunday. There is no way I can miss a Sunday. I'm a pastor. I'm very important. Right? And look at me now. I'm here. Right? But we guilt ourselves thinking we have to do, do, do. And some of us have trouble scheduling vacations because it's more work to actually get away. And there's more work to come back to. So it just seems easier to stay at work. Notice that there's really not such a thing as a work-life balance anymore, especially over these last three years. They've just kind of melded together, right? And there's a cost to that. We have play circuits in our brains, and when they are not stimulated, those neural pathways don't get connected. And when they're not connected, we are less able to be resilient, we are less able to regulate our emotions. We're less able to problem solve. And I don't know about you, but those make a good worker bee, right? So we need to play in order to live well in our working life as well. But we've lost our way. and We've just focused on the work part. This is nothing new. It's not just our society. We see it with the very first humans, Adam and Eve. They've been placed in a garden. They have everything that they need. 
All they have to do is receive the gift. But there's that one tree that they're supposed to leave alone, right? But they could have more if they went to that tree. And the serpent just had to whisper in their ear, if you eat from that tree, you could be more, you could have more, you could know more, you could even be like God. So why not go for the upgrade, right? (laughs) So again, they immediately go into that strive, strive for more, not just receiving what has been given to them. And so here in creation, God is modeling for us the life that God intends for us. The scripture passage calls us back and invites us to pattern our lives in the same way that God patterns God's life. If you heard those first two verses, again, we hear that we are created in the very image of God. And so God wanted us to be able to carry God's likeness out into the world to be God's representatives throughout, to pattern our lives in the same ways. And then then in the next four verses, we hear exactly what that pattern is. So I'm going to read it for you again. It says, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished in all their multitude. On the sixth day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So we see God being playful in creation. And then there's the other part of God being playful in God's rest. We, too, can be playful in our work and playful in our rest. There's time for both, and God invites us to embrace that. So next week, we'll be hearing from Pastor Stephen about that creativity and playfulness in God as we look at creation and the work that God did those first six days. But today we're going to look at this God who rests. If we're made in the image of God, and we do what God does, then we too are called to rest. So what is it that we learn? What is it that we learn about God in this very first story in the Bible? We learn that God is not a workaholic. You see, God is the source of all energy, all life. God never tires. God never runs out of creativity or imagination. God doesn't need a vacation. God doesn't need a nap. God doesn't need a break to refresh and renew to keep on going. Yet God still chose intentionally to rest. God's very value, he wanted to set it up right from the get-go, so that our value doesn't come from what we do, but it is simply in who we are. So if God is not a workaholic, why do we think we need to be? In our culture, we get so much value from what we do what we accomplish, how we volunteer, how we spend our time doing for others. But in this moment that God ceases to create, we see that God blesses rest and calls it good. Now, if we can't remember that God has modeled this behavior for us, God put little reminders throughout nature for us 
to recognize the natural rhythms of life. There's the changing of the seasons. There's a sunrise and sunset. There are times when plants flourish and flower and bear fruit. And then there are times when they lie dormant. We are called to follow that same pattern of work and rest. So if we are made in the image of God, God is not a workaholic. We don't need to be workaholics. So I want you to say that with me. We don't need to be workaholics. All right? One, two, three. We don't need to be workaholics. Another thing we learn about God is that God is able to rest in creation. I don't know if you picked up on this, but there is no sense of anxiety within God. He's not saying, did I do enough? Did I make enough animals? Did I I do enough plants? Are they going to be able to make it? Right? God trusts that Creation will flourish and function in the way that God designed it. And that allows God to step back and to just enjoy, to delight in creation. God, God's self experiences that peace and security, that nothing more has to be done. It is good And it is good enough. There's no label that can come from the outside world, right? That gives us our value. But we are enough just as we are. So if we are made in the image of God, and God can rest in creation having no anxiety, trusting that God's grace is sufficient, we can too. So I want you to say with me, we can rest in God's creation. We can rest in God's creation. Now we just played that mirror game. And I want you to think about who in your life has been on the other side of that mirror? Who have you been modeling after? Who have you been modeling for? If we are made in the image of God, then we must reflect the ways of God. So when God moves, we move. When God works, we work. If God weeps, we weep. If God plays, we can play. It's an invitation to live life to the fullest. Now, it was all good and well that God modeled this pattern for us, but guess what? We didn't catch on, right? If you read the rest of the book of Genesis, you're going to feel really good about yourself, okay? It was just a bunch of characters messing up over and over and over again. But God doesn't give up. He keeps on trying. So in Genesis, God models the behavior, right? Some teachers can probably identify with this. God models the behavior But then by the second chapter, or a second book in the Bible, God makes it a commandment. Because that wasn't enough to just model the behavior. we got to be direct, right? Keep the Sabbath and keep it holy. That's one of the Ten Commandments. So when were the Ten Commandments given to the people of God? I want you to answer. What event came right before that? The Exodus, right. So the people had been enslaved in Egypt under the rule of Pharaoh. 
and they were caught in a system that required all work and no rest, no play. They were driven by a Pharaoh who was insatiable. His desire for more and more bricks came with less and less materials, and the demands just became more stringent as time passed on. And God saw God's people suffering, and he remembered that this was not the life God created us for. God created us to be more than just a cog in the machine. God created us to not be defined by what we can or cannot contribute to society. God created us to be God's children. So therefore, when God emancipates the people from this system of slavery, God claims You are mine. You are made in my image. You will live by my rules. And the Ten Commandments are given. And I'm going to sum those up in three. Jesus could do it in two, but I'm going to do it in three. Right? The first three, God is saying, you will worship me and worship me alone. You do not worship your work. You do not worship your boss. You do not worship the pharaohs in this world. You do not worship any little G gods that try to come in the way. Remember who you belong to. And the fourth commandment is the commandment of Sabbath, that you will rest And in our resting, we're not going to do it just on our own. We've we've proven that, right? So God had to command it and say that we needed to be intentional about it. So again, we remember who we belong to and what our ultimate end is in God. And then the last verses, they teach us to love one another and care for one another in such a way that everybody gets a turn. Everybody has a chance to work and rest and play. Everybody gets to live life abundantly when we care for one another. God wanted us to be set apart, to live differently and the way our culture tempts us to live. And so throughout our history, taking a Sabbath continues to be a rebellion. Any rebels in the room like to break the rules? Take a Sabbath. Give it to the man, right? (laughs) We are rebelling when we take our Sabbaths because we're saying that we will not be enslaved by our culture again. When we practice intentional rest, we are claiming that identity given to us by God. We are claiming that we are created in the image of the divine. We can rest. We live by different rules, and we are more than what we do. When we take Sabbath, we rebel, and we admit that we are not everything to everyone. In taking Sabbath, we are enacting humility, acknowledging that life will go on without us. We allow God to be the one that's actually in control. And we let go of that anxiety. And maybe life will go on in such a way that you would not have done it that way. (laughs) But life will go on. God will continue. When we take Sabbath, we rebel. 
by taking this deep act of trust in God. We give up that anxiety over not being the one to do fill in the blank. (laughs) To give ourselves permission to just let go. To be like God and just step back and trust that things are in place. That you don't have to meddle in everything for all to go right. (laughs) That you can take delight in what you have worked to accomplish. And you can celebrate that and be transformed by the peace and the joy that comes. When we acknowledge that life is actually a gift. It is not something that we are creating for ourselves. Now you'll notice that keeping Sabbath is that midpoint that keeps us in right relationship with God as we acknowledge that God is our creator, the one who does actually run the world. (laughs) And then the other half is what keeps us in right relationship with our community, of caring for one another, of making sure everyone's well-being is flourishing. The Sabbath is incredibly important in our spiritual lives. So I want you to take a moment to write down and name at least one thing, just one thing you can do in this week that will allow you to practice Sabbath. Maybe you can't commit to 24 hours, so start with 15 minutes. What is one thing you can delay on your to-do list? Let it wait till tomorrow so that you can rest in God's creation and in God's presence today. Maybe another helpful way to think about it is what kind of play can you engage in that helps you to let go of any anxiety, that helps you forget those distractions of the world and allows you to just be in the present moment. Inside your bulletin, there is a notes section in the middle. And I want you to actually take it out and write it down, just like the Ten Commandments were written in stone. (laughs) You're going to write your own commandments for how you are going to practice Sabbath this week. I want you to hold that commitment as we pray together. I reviewed this book again this week um, by Walter Brueggemann. He's a great Old Testament scholar, and one of my favorite authors um, and theologians to study with. And he wrote this book called Sabbath as Resistance. It's a small group. It's pretty skinny. And it has a study guide in the back. Okay, so that's a a resource if that interests you. But in the study guide, he has written a prayer called Falling Back into Reliable Goodness. So let's pray together. God, from the outset, you called the world very good. Unlike you, we find the world a dangerous, demanding locus for our lives. We are beset by fears of scarcity and running out. We're visited by fears of falling behind and not measuring up. We're occupied with rumors of war, danger, and terror. We're frantic to protect our little places of well-being. We are weary of achieving and accomplishing. 
We are exhausted with neighbors who seem to us like competitors and threats. In our anxiety, we find the world at best bearable, but less than very good. You, O creator of heaven and earth, you are so unlike us. You do the orderly, proper business of creation, of seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. You sustain the regularity of seasons, sun, moon, stars, and wind. And then you pause in confidence, sure that the world will hold, unworried about scarcity, certain about flourishing, unbothered about the threat of chaos. We imagine you peaceable, cherishing your good world at leisure, not restless, anxious, or worried. We are so unlike you in our anxiety and fatigue. We resolve, nevertheless, in your presence, God, to be more like you, to imitate you, to fall back into quiet confidence and serenity. Like you, may we trust that your world will hold. Like you, may we enjoy the good order of your creation. Like you, may we be at rest and unanxious. Oh God, we are so unlike you. And you are so unlike us. And now in this moment of honesty before you, we promise to replicate your restfulness, finding ourselves able to bask in your reliable goodness, unanxious, unafraid, unbothered, unworried, defined by your durable goodness. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. As we come to the close of our worship, we want to send you out reminding you that the world is not on your shoulders. So we're going to sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. The words will be on the screen or you can find it in your hymnal on page 133, I believe. Yes. Um, and if anybody would like to Respond to God by joining the church today. You are welcome to come up as we sing or we can visit after the service. Um, you can find Pastor Stephen or I. But let's stand and remember to lean on God's promises.
y'all sing pretty good. Before I send you out, I want to let you know one, know one thing going on in the life of the church. Carla, come up here, please. We have vacation Bible school this summer. It's been a weird few years, but we've come out of it. And now we're going to have an awesome vacation Bible school. We're going to share the love of God with kids in our community. But we're doing it differently this year. Carla, what time is Vacation Bible School going to be? From 5 to 7.30 p.m. 5 to 7.30 p.m. Why aren't we doing it in the morning? So that a different group of people will be able to come than in the past. We're trying to let families who have working parents be part of Vacation Bible School. So we're doing it in the evening. And so if you have kids, come and see Carla after worship. If you have grandkids, come see Carla after worship. Where are you going to be? I'm going to be in the north end. She's going to be out there in the foyer. All right? If you would like to work with kids, if you would like to come and have dinner and be part of this time, come. Visit Carla. All right? That's the announcement I've got. My friends... Missy reminded us this morning that even God takes a break. Our souls need time. Sabbath is, part of it is gathering with our community of faith and gathering and worship and praying and lifting our hearts and voices to God. But that's not all Sabbath is. It's about slowing down, taking a time to let your soul and your body rest so you can be renewed to take oh, to, to, for the week ahead. May you find refreshment this week. May you find rest in your soul so that you can live as an agent of God's love. May you take time this week to just breathe so that you can live a life of goodness and love. Go in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.